The Gospel Ministry by James Henley Thornwell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Romans 1 5. The permanent features of the apostolic office were the same as those of the ministerial office at the present day. All that was peculiar has passed away, and there is not a shadow of foundation in the word of God for the prelatical opinion that in their peculiar duties the twelve could be followed by successors. To have seen Christ with the natural eye was an indispensable prerequisite for discharging the distinctive duties of the apostleship. They were, in an eminent sense, the witnesses of his resurrection, and in order to bear an adequate testimony to this important fact, they were required to have the best of all evidence, that of their own senses. Hence Paul, in vindicating his claims to this office, rests them upon the fact that he had seen Christ. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? While, therefore, the peculiar functions of the apostleship ceased with those who had been the eyewitnesses of our Saviour's resurrection, we have reason to thank God that in the solemn and important duties of the ministry the twelve are now followed and will be followed by successors to the end of time. Hence the language of the text is just as appropriate to ministers of the present day as it was to the apostles in the infancy of the church, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. In these words we have the authority, the immediate end, and the ultimate design of the Christian ministry. A brief exposition of these points, with a few reflections naturally arising from them, will fill up the scope of the present discourse. First, the authority of the Christian ministry. That this office is a divine institution, that it rests upon the authority of God, is amply sustained by the testimony of Scripture. This is the appointed channel through which the saving doctrines of the gospel are to flow out upon the world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That the ministerial office was designed to be permanent seems to be a necessary inference from the ascending commission of our Saviour. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It would be difficult to conceive how the doctrines of the cross could be widely and successfully and faithfully disseminated without such an office in the church. If we depended altogether on the press for the inculcation and enforcement of divine truth, the probability is that few would read and fewer still would obey the holy commands of the Saviour. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing supposes a living minister. Such is the repugnance of the carnal heart to the things of the Spirit of God that it will not attend to them unless they are forced on its attention by constant and reiterated efforts. Sinners hate the truth and will not come to it, and would willingly and gladly live in a total ignorance of it, and yet their eternal all depends upon a cordial acceptance and hearty approbation of the truth as it is in Christ. There must be men, therefore, set apart to hold it up before them, to enforce its claims with all the solemn sanctions of eternity, and to persuade sinners by all the tender and awful considerations of the gospel to receive Christ. There must be Christian ministers clothed with divine authority, and commissioned to go forth among the rebellious sons of men, and to urge upon their acceptance the gratuitous offer of life. There must be men to warn the guilty of their danger, to point the mourner to the source of consolation, and to stand and plead for God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. The ministerial office is a necessary and indispensable one. It is the appointed means by which a knowledge of the Saviour is kept up and diffused among men, and we cannot conceive the awful spiritual gloom which would cover the world if all the watchmen on the walls of Zion were to lay down their trumpets and cease to lift up their voices for God and for eternity. We conclude, therefore, that the ministerial office is not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, 
and God the Father who raised him from the dead, by whom, that is by Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Second, the immediate end which the ministry should have in view is here termed obedience to the faith. Faith may in this connection mean either the whole gospel or that particular feature of the gospel which relates to justification. The two ideas are intimately associated. A true justifying saving faith will always be followed by the fruits of holiness, so that obedience to the faith in the point of justifying righteousness will ensure an obedience to the gospel in all its requirements. The object of the Christian minister is, therefore, to persuade men to be reconciled to God through Christ, to persuade them to accept of the blessed Saviour in all his offices, and to rest upon him and him alone for wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is to know nothing among his people but Christ Jesus and him crucified, and he is to travail in birth for them until Christ be formed in them the hope of glory, until they be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, until, being rooted and grounded in love, they may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. The minister is sent into a world at enmity with God, in a state of rebellion against his rightful authority, and under his wrath and curse. The business of the minister, thus commissioned and sent forth, is to hold up Christ before these rebels as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He is to labour for the destruction of their enmity against God, for their cordial submission to his authority, and for the restoration of the divine image upon their hearts. He goes among men spiritually dead, and his errand is to bring them to life. He goes among men sporting on the brink of a burning precipice, and his business is to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. He goes among sinners, lost, helpless, and undone, and his work is to free them from the power of sin and from its tremendous doom. The language of the apostle is strong, it is obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. The duties of the gospel minister are solemn and momentous, they are not a routine of idle services designed only to while away the hours of the Sabbath, but his business is to see that men obey the gospel. It is not enough that they know its truths and acknowledge its doctrines, but they must surrender their whole heart to the Saviour and govern their lives by his holy instructions. Every thought must be brought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. Lofty imaginations must be cast down, self-righteousness destroyed, and God become all in all. The gospel will prove a savour of death unto death if it be not cordially received and cheerfully obeyed. In vain the Saviour died and offered a sacrifice for the sins of his people and brought in an everlasting righteousness on their behalf if they be not influenced to receive him as their prophet, priest, and king. Obedience to the faith is indispensable to salvation, and if the minister is anxious that sinners be saved, he must be equally solicitous that they obey the truth. Let him remember, then, that he has a distinct and definite end in view, an end which he should never forget, for which he should always toil. Let him remember that sinners cannot be saved without obedience to the faith, and that he, as the ambassador of Christ, has received grace and apostleship for the purpose of accomplishing this high end, as an humble instrument in the hands of God. Third, the ultimate design of the gospel ministry is the glory of God. Men are rendered obedient to the faith for his name. The gospel glorifies God by the strong light which it throws upon his character and government, and all who obey the gospel are monuments erected to the praise of the glory of his grace, while all who reject it, vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, make known his power and declare his eternal justice. The brightest exhibition of the divine character is found in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the clearest illustration of the divine attributes is reflected from Mount Calvary. If the gospel gives glory to God, surely the minister, the means of making it known, must glorify God too. Hence the apostle says, For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto death, to the other the savour of life unto life. God acts in all things with a reference to his own glory, and in the fact that his own glory consists in the excellence of his infinite perfections we have the strongest assurance that in all things the Lord of all the earth will do right. Should we suppose for a moment, and I would not for the world harbour the supposition, should we suppose that his counsels were controlled by any other end, we could not have the same security for the wise and equitable government of the world, but it is a precious, 
a delightful truth that by him are all things, for him are all things, to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Having now briefly pointed out the authority, immediate end, and ultimate design of the ministry, I proceed to draw a few inferences which naturally arise from these points. 1. If the ministry rests upon divine authority, the authority of Christ, no man may take this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God. Hence the apostles are always explicit in stating that they received their commission from above. Paul was called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God called to be an apostle of jesus christ through the will of god and the prophets evangelists and teachers it is more than insinuated derived their commission from god it is daring presumption for any man to intrude himself into the sacred office who has not been called to it by the holy ghost it rests with god and with god alone to designate the men who shall preach the gospel of his son he calls them to their work by the operations of his spirit on their hearts impresses upon them a deep conviction of duty and excites in their breasts corresponding desires to promote his glory in the gospel of christ if men engage in the ministry from the influences of such motives as cannot be ascribed to the holy spirit they incur a fearful guilt in the sight of god by assuming to themselves his exclusive prerogative two how fearful is the guilt of those who reject the message of an authorized ambassador he comes from god he speaks with divine authority and to reject his message is to treat the saviour with contempt if our blessed redeemer has identified himself with the meanest of his followers and regards the wrongs inflicted upon them as wrongs inflicted upon himself how surely will he make common cause with his ministers and treat all the despisers of them and their message as despisers of himself when a minister of the gospel beseeches sinners to turn from the error of their ways it is god who does it by him and to disregard the warning of the minister is to despise god now then we are ambassadors of christ as though god did beseech you by us we pray you in christ's stead be ye reconciled to god oh it is a solemn thing to hear a gospel sermon from the lips of a gospel minister it is an awful thing to despise god in the person of his ambassadors take heed therefore how ye hear hear as from god hear as for eternity three if the immediate end of the gospel ministry is obedience to the faith the minister should always have his attention fixed definitely upon this end it is to be regretted that too much of ministerial labour is functionary the ambassadors of god too often forget their high aim and proclaim his message without the least expectation of success in their work they preach because they are required to preach the sabbath has arrived and they must while away an hour from the pulpit because the people expect it this is a dreadful state of things my ministering brethren let us always remember that sinners must be eternally damned unless they obey the gospel let us preach for life and death let us move heaven and earth in the great commotion preach for the saving of souls for the glory of god our work is not done unless sinners do obey the gospel to bring about this result is our business ought to be our constant aim we should have our eyes singly fixed upon it we should never preach for the sake of preaching but always for the sake of obedience one great reason why we meet with so little success is that we do not expect success often it would surprise us to be told that sinners were cut to the heart under our ministry i repeat it too much of our labour is merely functionary a dry matter of course this was not the spirit in which paul laboured he received his commission for a specific object and that object in deep reliance on the holy spirit he endeavoured to accomplish let us remember then that we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name that in christ's stead we must beseech sinners to be reconciled to god four if we would bring about obedience to the faith fidelity in preaching the truth is indispensably necessary a faithful preacher is one who preaches the whole truth in its proper connection and dependence and in a style and manner suited to the capacity of his hearers no truth of god is valueless and that man who fails to declare the whole counsel of god is recreant to his trust the doctrines of the gospel are humbling to the pride of the human heart but they must be faithfully proclaimed whether the people will cordially receive them or not this is a day of heresy unfaithful ministers have corrupted the truth of god the distinguishing doctrines of the gospel have been robbed of their peculiarities in order to suit them to the carnal mind but such abominable temporizing is unworthy of a minister of the everlasting gospel he must preach the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth 
It is this which God employs in awakening and converting the sinner and in the sanctification of his people, and it is the bounden duty of a minister to see to it that his people are well instructed in the great principles of the gospel. And let him always remember that the burden of the scriptures is Christ crucified. The blessed Saviour in his work and offices must be held up before them as the object of their faith and their only Saviour moses in the law and the prophets wrote of him of him do the scriptures testify and the sum and substance of the gospel is christ our wisdom righteousness sanctification and redemption but it is not only necessary to preach the whole truth it must be preached in its proper connection and dependence much injury may be done by presenting the truths of the bible in a detached and isolated form for instance the divine sovereignty may be so preached as to lead to fatalism and the moral agency of man in such a manner as to lead to pelagianism but fidelity also implies plainness and simplicity there are some men who enter the desk only to show themselves to gratify their vanity in the applause of their hearers and to exhibit their learning and fine attainments at the peril of their own souls and the souls of their people these men we always expect to find preaching in buskins but he who preaches for the salvation of souls for obedience to the faith must labour to be understood by the meanest of his hearers they cannot obey unless they understand what they are required to obey he is sent to teach them and what sort of instruction is that which is couched in language beyond the reach of their capacity he might as well talk in latin or greek as speak in a style of which they are not masters how different was the manner of paul and i brethren when i came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power it is reported of archbishop tillotson that he uniformly read his sermons to an old woman in the neighbourhood before he preached them in order that he might ascertain whether he had used any words which the meanest of his people could not comprehend fidelity implies besides that a minister's instructions be peculiarly suited to the wants of his people preaching to be powerful must be direct and it cannot be direct when it is unsuited to the state of the people it is this directness in preaching which has caused many sinners to tremble under the truth and led them to suspect that their minister had some secret means of ascertaining their characters and state this is one great secret of success in the ministry and without it a man is shooting in the dark the epistles of paul exhibit in a remarkable degree this feature of directness he shows himself intimately acquainted with the wants of the churches to which he writes and his exhortations and advice and instructions are eminently suited to their respective states who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season blessed is that servant whom his lord when he cometh shall find so doing five it need hardly be remarked that earnestness is a necessary feature of successful preaching at the bar and in the senate chamber we find men deeply interested and heartily engaged in the cause which they have espoused while in the house of god the melancholy spectacle of coldness and indifference on subjects of eternal concern is too frequently exhibited there are men so scrupulously careful of correctness and decorum that it would almost seem that they would sooner sacrifice a soul than commit a blunder in grammar or perpetrate an awkward gesture how can a minister who feels the value of the soul or the realities of eternity be cold and unmoved when warning sinners to flee from the wrath to come heaven or hell life or death eternal life or eternal death depend upon the success of his message and and can he be indifferent whether it is received or not can he see the terrible cloud of divine wrath gathering thick above the sinner's head ready to beat in one tremendous storm upon him and not be in earnest in warning him of danger eternity is at stake the minister must be earnest if he has the soul and feelings of a christian he must be earnest the law thunders in terrific peals its notes of condemnation the saviour groans and dies and meets its demands yet the sinner is asleep asleep on the very brink of hell and who will awake him sinai and calvary alike urge the minister to be earnest he must lift his voice like a trumpet until the sinner hears his warning and obeys his instructions isaiah was in earnest paul was in earnest all the faithful ministers of christ must be in earnest there is too much at stake to trifle here the soul the soul the immortal soul is deeply concerned and who can think of the tremendous realities of the eternal world without strong emotion or discuss the question of life and death as dryly and coldly as a question in philosophy six 
much of the success of the gospel depends on the personal character of the minister himself he must be a pious man grace and apostleship are joined together by the apostle in my text and ought always to be inseparable companions he must experience deeply in his own heart those solemn truths which he preaches to others he must be a man of prayer the holy spirit alone can give saving efficacy to the truths of the gospel and the holy spirit is ordinarily bestowed in answer to prayer a minister should live upon his knees he should bear his people as his own children to a throne of grace and his sermons ought to be carried from the closet to the desk he must lay the state of his people before god he must plead with god for them and leave them in god's hands and oh what a precious privilege is this alleluia the lord god omnipotent reigneth lo i am with you always even to the end of the world the minister must also be a man of deep humility he must feel his own nothingness and vileness and his entire dependence upon divine aid the apostle paul gloried in his infirmities that the grace of christ might be magnified when he was weak then he was strong when he was poor then he was rich that christ might be all in all just in proportion as a minister feels that he is nothing and that the whole success of his ministry depends upon grace just in the same proportion will be his earnest supplications for the holy spirit he will regard himself as only an instrument of god in the conversion of sinners and his eyes will always be directed to the hill whence all his help must come spiritual pride and spiritual self-sufficiency are formidable barriers to ministerial success and the man who depends upon his own eloquence or skill or learning to do the work of grace will find at last that vain is the help of man whose breath is in his nostrils there is need then of deep humility and correspondent dependence on divine aid if a minister would secure among his people obedience to the faith the work is god's he must have the glory and if we trust to ourselves and go forward in our own unassisted strength he may justly give us up to lying delusions and a reprobate mind woe to them that go down to egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong but they look not unto the holy one of israel neither seek the lord paul may plant and apollos water but god alone can give the increase so then neither is he that planteth anything neither he that watereth but god that giveth the increase yet there is a deep personal responsibility imposed upon the minister and if he would be successful in his work he must feel the weight that rests upon him so thou o son of man i have set thee a watchman unto the house of israel therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me when i say unto the wicked o wicked man thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way that wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will i require at thy hand nevertheless if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it if he do not turn from his way he shall die in his iniquity but thou hast delivered thy soul if a minister has any adequate sense of the value of the soul which in some sense is committed to him of the tremendous retributions of the eternal world the intolerable severity of the wrath of god he must feel an awful burden resting on his shoulders he has in his hands the words of eternal life the people look to him for spiritual guidance and instruction and if any perish through lack of knowledge their blood will be required at his hands he sees men dead and he is the instrument to raise them to life he sees the awful tempest of divine wrath bursting upon them and he must warn them of their danger he sees them in a state of stubborn rebellion against god and his government the slaves of passion appetite and lust and he under god must break the charm bring them back to allegiance and present them perfect washed and sanctified before the presence of his father ah well may we exclaim with the apostle who is sufficient for these things a word or look may stab the saviour in the house of his friends and seriously affect the state of the ungodly the responsibilities of the minister are so awfully perilous that none could be found who entertained proper views of its duties to assume the office without the strongest assurances of divine aid he must feed the flock with the bread of god's word with his holy and eternal truth and oh what a fearful thing it is to preach philosophy and vain deceit when his commission requires the gospel of christ who can dare in view of eternity and the bar of god to preach himself instead of his master and to deal out his own devices in lieu of the oracles of god let the minister feel his responsibility as he should feel it and he will be found very careful as to what he preaches and how he preaches he will then know nothing but jesus christ and him crucified the wisdom of god and the power of god for salvation to every one that believeth seven 
if the grand design of the gospel is the glory of god it is quite certain that this must be an object dear to the minister's heart he should desire that sinners should embrace the gospel as well for the glory of his master as for their own salvation unbelief casts a slur upon the divine character and it must be a subject of deep solicitude to one who loves the law and government of god to find men in rebellion against him this trait of ministerial character is beautifully portrayed in the person of elijah i have been very jealous says he for the lord god of hosts for the children of israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword and i even i only am left and they seek my life to take it away his chief concern was for the honour of god he was very jealous for the lord god of hosts and was deeply grieved that the children of israel had abandoned his worship the gospel does glorify god every repenting sinner glorifies god with the cheerful tribute of his heart and will add one more to the host of the redeemed who cease not day nor night to ascribe glory and honour and power and dominion to the lamb that sitteth on the throne for ever and ever eight the work of the ministry must occupy the minister's undivided attention he must be free from worldly cares and secular pursuits the duties of his office are arduous and responsible they require an intimate acquaintance with his people communion with god and patient and laborious study he cannot discharge them faithfully and successfully if he finds it unnecessary to add to them the harassing burden of a farm or a school the great duty of pastoral visitation which renders him familiar with the wants of his people must be omitted if his time in the week is taken up with the business of a secular avocation and even his devotions on the sabbath cannot be single and undivided if his attention has been greatly occupied with worldly pursuits it is the duty of the people to support their minister fully and abundantly and if they discharged it they would find themselves amply repaid in the increased success and riches of his labours he carries upon his shoulders in the office of the ministry a load which would bear an angel down if unassisted by god and shall we add to its solemn responsibilities the additional labour of secular pursuits it is wrong they that labour at the altar must live by the altar they who give spiritual things must be supplied with temporal things they have a right to be supported it is a matter of sheer justice and not of charity as the people too commonly suppose it is a principle distinctly recognized in the word of god and forcibly inculcated under the mosaic economy and the churches cannot abandon it now without the just imputation of guilt such in a feeble inadequate view is the gospel ministry a divine appointment for wise and holy ends there is abundant ground of gratitude that the foolishness of preaching was ever instituted to reclaim a perishing world christianity boasts of no splendid rites no imposing ceremonies no dazzling institutions it is by the simple means of a stated ministry that her truths are impressed and her duties enforced and has not the foolishness of preaching done wonders for the world has it not opened the eyes of the blind unstopped the ears of the deaf and unloosed the tongues of the dumb has it not made sinners tremble at their guilt and poured into the wounds of the afflicted soul the healing balm of consolation let the truth be preached faithfully plainly earnestly and humbly by the authorized ambassador of god and the holy spirit will accompany it and give it power on the heart for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which i please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto i sent it success is of god and the faithful minister has the cheering encouragement that christ is always with him without such encouragement who could preach who would assume the perilous responsibilities of the sacred office if he had not more than human aid and more than human consolation but the saviour is with him and a glorious eternity before him and round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats i saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold the four-and-twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth for ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory honour and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created end of the gospel ministry by james henley thornwell <laughs>